Okay, so this lecture and the next are uh, kind of a offshoot of image processing, which I would call image reconstruction from projections. And basically, this is the foundation for how CAP computed axial tomography or CT scanners work. Okay. And so the idea is that, you know, I think I drew this kind of initially, you're the patient, you're lying on a kind of a table, there's like a little bed that you're lying on, this is a pretty crappy picture, and the idea is that you go through this machine, I'll show you a couple pictures of real machines in just a second, that is scanning kind of cross sections of your body, okay, with projections of x-rays, and then using those projections it reconstructs the interior of your body, okay? And so, um, let me show you a couple examples. What we're going to talk about first is, so here, here's a couple, couple, yeah, a couple pictures from the book, okay? So there are lots of different geometries for how this uh, process of x-rays going through the patient can occur, okay? And so what we're going to talk about today is the upper left-hand case, where basically you've got a set of, uh, like you've got an x-ray source that is pushing parallel beams of x-rays through the patient and receiving those at a detector, okay? And then next time, on Thursday, we're going to talk more about these kinds of things where instead of there being a set of parallel beams, you instead you have what's called a fan beam, a, a set of beams that is kind of pushing out from a central source and directing diverging rays out towards the patient, okay? So there are, <clears throat> there are several generations, they call them, of CT scanners, and so you'd kind of call this up here like generation one, and this is like generation two, generation three, generation four. And probably most of the stuff that you'd see in a, you know, hospital or clinic today is along the lines of this scanner here. Uh, although if you go to a really good hospital like, you know, Mass General Hospital or Memorial Sloan County Cancer Center, they're going to have even more advanced uh, stuff, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about next time. Okay, so here's just a couple pictures. Um, so here's what the inside of a CAT scan machine looks like. And so what you can see here is this is a X-ray source, and this is the patient bed, and the X-ray source is going to shoot beams through the patient, and over here behind these fans is the set of X-ray detectors. And this whole thing spins around the patient very fast. And so here's a, a video of the actual uh, spinning CAT scan. And so you can see that once it gets up to speed, it's going pretty fast, right? So, uh, you know, think about that the next time you're inside the scanner, that this thing is this huge chunk of metal that is spinning like crazy. The patient goes here. There. So, um, yeah. All right, I don't think we have to watch the whole minute of this. So, okay. <clears throat> All right, so that's the good news. The bad news is, for you guys, that this is a very mathematical uh, lecture. This one and the next one are going to be the most intense math that we do for the whole course, okay? So get ready for derivations and integrals and all that good stuff, okay? But by the end of it, at least you'll know, like, how this stuff actually works. Okay, so the principles of um, how this works have been known for a long time. So basically, um, there's something that we're going to talk about today called the radon transform. And that's been known since, like, you know, almost 100 years, okay? But, of course, they didn't have the ability to create x-rays and deliver them and push them through patients until much later. And so, um, you know, basically, the, 19, the 1979 Nobel Prize <coughs> was given to two guys, Cormac and Hounsfield, who were the ones who decided, or who, who were able to make this uh, X-ray imaging process practical in real medical medical applications, okay? <coughs> okay, so let's just consider <coughs> one cross-section of the patient. Unfortunately, you can still hear I'm kind of froggy, so sorry for my voice. Okay, so here's the patient, and <coughs> let's suppose that the X-rays are coming at the patient in this direction, okay? And so the whole premise of this is that <clears throat> the, 
if the X-ray doesn't hit the patient at all, <clears throat> it's just passing through the air, and its energy is not attenuated at all, okay? Whereas, as the X-ray is passed through tissue and flesh and bone, some of the energy of the X-ray is absorbed by the patient, okay? And that means that if I think about an absorption profile, that basically nothing is absorbed out here, and then as I kind of go through the center of the patient, I have, you know, more X-rays being absorbed, okay? And so, let's think about this in the sense of um, MATLAB, right? So all we're doing basically is we're taking the, you can think about taking the image intensities along each of these lines and adding them up or integrating them to produce kind of a profile and then by going along different directions of the patient, we get different profiles. And so the premise is, if we see enough of these profiles, kind of intuitively, we should be able to understand how to reconstruct inside the patient, okay? And so here's a simple case. <clears throat> you know, let's suppose that the patient looks like a circle, right? White circle on a black background. So if I project x-rays this way and integrate, I'm going to get something that kind of looks like, uh, you know, this integral, right? And if I project x-rays this way, I'm going to get something that kind of looks like this integral. And one idea is, what if I were to take the things that I see and do what's called back projection, okay? so. The idea is that I could look at the um, kind of pushing this profile in the same direction of the x-rays to produce kind of a smear. And this is called back projection. We're going to talk about this a lot more, so don't get worried right now. But the idea is that what I could do is I could say, okay, I could kind of produce a smear, it kind of has this same cross-section going this way, and I could produce this kind of smear, I guess I can draw it like this, that would have the same kind of cross-section going that way, and then I could say, okay, now I look for the places where these two things intersect, right? So if I add this plus this, then I get something that looks like big in the middle and fainter in the other areas, right? So kind of what I would see would be something that would look kind of like a, you know, a radially symmetric bump. I'm going to show you a real example so that you don't, like, just try to figure it out from this. Basically, this would be, you know, the most overlap between these things. And I'd have a little bit less overlap here, 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 and here. So let me just show you a MATLAB example of this to make this more concrete, because I know this is bad when I'm trying to draw it on paper. Okay. so. Here is a exact replica of what I just showed you, right? So here's my simple image, okay? And what I can do is I can plot the integral of that image in whatever direction I want, okay? As we're going to talk about in just a second, that's related to what's called the radon transform. So um, MATLAB has a function, radon, that helps us with this, and so what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, let me show me what the uh, plot looks like if I were to integrate this picture straight down. Well, it looks like the integral of the circle, right? And so, um, you know, it's nothing in the black areas, and then it ramps up until I've got the full radius of the circle, and then it ramps back down, right? And if I were to plot that at any angle, I get the same thing, right? Because no matter what degree I project that circle from, I'm always going to get the same, you know, the same basic projection, right? <clears throat> and so if I were to have a different image, so let's look at this guy. So here's a slightly different image where I've got a big circle that's white and a smaller circle that's kind of gray, right? And so here, if I were to project 
this image, uh, let me first do it like this, right? For, if I were just to project it straight down, I would get two little peaks, right? One corresponds to the big white circle that has a lot of intensity. One corresponds to the little gray circle, which is smaller and is also darker, right? So if I project it straight down, let me just remind you of what the um, original image looked like. Right, so if I were to project <coughs> this image straight down, I've got big white circle and then little gray circle. If I were to project it left to right the other way, then I'm going to get something much different, right? So if I project it the other way, what I'm going to get is, here, let me uh, put that image back up again. So here, if I project it left to right, what I'm going to get is that the little gray circle is going to overlap the big white circle, and I'm going to get kind of this extra little peak that comes in the middle. So instead of looking like a straight, you know, quadratic curve, instead I've got this little hump in the middle. Okay. So in this in this view, I can't really disambiguate the small circle from the big circle. Right? They're not very well separated. So the idea is, okay, well, what if I were to take the projections? Let's, let's go back to our first circle, okay? So, so what if I were to take my projections for all the different angles and smear them out in the appropriate directions and add them up, okay? So here's an example of that. So what if I were to take, for example, the... And don't worry about these um, functions right now. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to take uh, my original image, I'm going to project it at zero degrees, <clears throat> and then I'm going to look at that as if I were to smear it out Smearing it out makes a kind of a vertical up and down white bar. That's like saying, take all that circle energy and smear it around, okay? And let me just make sure that I've done this like this. Right, it actually looks more like this because there's more energy in the middle and it drops off to the sides, right? Now if I took the smear from up and down and added it to the smear left to right, what would I start to see? So what I can do is I can say, okay, I'm going to take a selection of uh, thetas, angles, that is, and I'm going to uh, take my radon transform, which I'm going to explain more about, so don't worry if you don't understand what that means quite yet, and then I'm going to add those two things back up. So here is the sum of the two smears, right? So this gives me something that is kind of close, right? Because I, it already tells me there's a blob in the middle of the image, right? But the fact is that this guy you know, has these, these cross arms that come from places where there's only one active smear, right? So maybe I could better if I were to make my theta sampling a little bit finer, right? So let's suppose I took a couple more angles and add them together from different directions, well, now I'm starting to get something that, again, the, the arms are kind of fading away a little bit. And if I keep on doing this to say, okay, let's suppose that I sample this every 20 degrees or so, then slowly and surely a circle is starting to form, right? And if I take this to kind of the, the limit and I say, okay, now I'm just going to take every degree, for example, a really fine sampling of theta, <coughs> and I show my sum, well now, actually this looks kind of like what I started with, right? But there's a problem, right? The problem is that there is this kind of halo, right? And also, I know that I started with a circle that was uniform intensity, right? But this circle seems like it's a little bit brighter in the middle and a little bit darker at the edges, right? So there are a couple of troubling things. The most troubling one is this fuzzy halo, because it turns out that theoretically, no matter how many, how fine I take my theta sampling, 
I'm always going to get this little blurry halo around the object. Okay? And we're going to explain the reason for that a little bit later in the lecture. Um, because you can imagine that, again, we're using this for mostly medical treatment and diagnosis, right? So you don't want to have something where the doctor overestimates the size of the tumor or doesn't see where it is because it's too blurry, right? I can do the same thing with the, um, I can do the same thing with the other image. So let's suppose I take um, that two circle image. Again, here's another case where if I don't take enough projections, then my kind of blurry and smeary part is almost threatening to overcome this, this guy here, right? And so I don't want to be in the situation where I miss something because the artifacts in the reconstruction have, have overcome something that is maybe a, a, a subtle light thing that I want, or a dark thing that I want to find. And here's another example. If I take all the projections, I can do a little better, but still, that you know, moon orbiting the Earth there is definitely a lot darker than it was in the original image, and it's almost subsumed by the same blur that's going around the image. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the issue: how can we do better than this? Okay, and so the answer lies in the formulation of this problem as basically a mathematical construct. Okay, so here's the math of how it works. Okay, so this is kind of related to the Huff transform that we talked about a few lectures ago for detecting the lines, right? Because again, here we're talking about lines going through an image, and so this idea of parameterizing a line is important. So if, if you recall, for the Huff transform, we were saying, okay, suppose I've got this line here, okay? And this may be slightly different than how I did it for the Huff transform, but either I could talk about this line as a slope and an intercept, right? We kind of talked about how in image processing, sometimes it's easier if I talk about <coughs> this angle, theta, and this perpendicular distance, rho, right? The Huff transform is basically a way of taking a line and mapping it into this rho theta space, okay? And so in rho theta terms, the line is described by this formula, x cosine theta plus y sine theta equals rho. These are two equivalent ways of representing this line, okay? And so if I tell you a fixed x, or I'm sorry, a fixed theta and a fixed rho, that corresponds to some line going through the image plane, okay? And so let me just draw another more complicated diagram, right? So here, what I'm gonna do is say, let's suppose that this is the x, y plane. Here I'm gonna use, again, Cartesian coordinates. Here is the patient, kind of a swiggly patient. And so let's suppose that I've got some, uh, what is the best way to do this here? Suppose this is the direction I'm gonna project, okay? So I'm gonna push x-rays through the patient and image them onto this plane. <coughs> Okay, so if I think about it, right, if I go back to my, my picture here, I have to figure out what are the rows and the thetas corresponding to each of these lines, right? So the theta has to do with the angle of the perpendicular. So if I think about this line here, this angle is theta, okay? And then each of these guys is a different row, right? This is like row one, row two, row three, row four all with the same theta. <clears throat> so I can say, okay, this is like the, the kth projection that I'm taking of the patient. And I'm gonna call this function, this projection function, g of rho j theta k, right? So j is indexing this guy and k is indexing this guy. And so for a fixed rho comma theta, that's like specifying one particular line, and that gives me 
this value here, which is like, you know, g of rho three comma theta k. <coughs> okay. So comments or questions about the setup? And just to make it a little bit nicer, here is a, you know, picture from the book that is exactly what I tried to draw in my clumsy way, right? Same thing. Okay. So, what next? Well, first of all, let me see if I can describe how do I get this number, okay? It's like an integral. It's an integral along a line going through the patient. So this is actually something that you may remember or may not remember from like calculus two, perhaps, or calculus three, a line integral, okay? And so let's write down what that actually means. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna think about this and I'm gonna say that my g of rho theta is like an integral across the xy planes. I'm gonna have a dx dy here. And I'm taking the image and I'm integrating that image <coughs> only where I'm along the line. And so I'm gonna kind of use this kind of abusive notation here to say here is that line I'm just going to add a delta function here. So it's basically saying where this inner condition is true, the delta function is firing, otherwise it's not, right? And this is called the radon transform. And that's exactly what I was doing with MATLAB, right? I was calling this function called radon that was doing this integral for me. And of course, you know, in the discrete world, all of these integrals are replaced by double sums, but we're going to keep everything in integral world this lecture and the next because it's much easier to talk about with continuous time. Okay, so questions or comments? Yeah? So the i, x, y, is that's the intensity of that pixel? Yes, this is basically just like our usual original image, right? And then the delta function is just on the line. What, what is the minus? So again, if I think about this line here is described by this equation, right? And so what I want is to say, I only want to look at the x and y where this is true, right? So I'm kind of moving the row over to the other side. <clears throat> okay, other comments or questions? Okay, so we can think about just like for the Huff transform, right? This is not the same as the Huff transform, but just like for the Huff transform, we can visualize this function of rho and theta as an image, right? And so, if we do that, that's what's called the sinogram of an image. And actually, the word comes from, the sino part comes from uh, not sines and cosines, but sinus, like the sinuses in your head, right? Which is a hole, right? So it's like a way of visualizing the holes in the image, apparently, is where the sinogram came from. And so you can do this with the radon transform. I wrote a little function to make it easier myself. So all I'm doing, if you see what I'm doing here, is this is just like basically cut and paste from the MATLAB help. I'm just taking the radon transform and I'm in showing it and putting a color bar on it. So not anything fancy. And so let's take a look at the sinogram of my original image, the one with the circle. Well, I guess uh, it looks like this, right? So if I do another figure, so again, the way to read this, and I guess that I kind of uh, maybe shouldn't put this quite side by side because I made it so you can't see the labels. So here, the x-axis, and let me see if I can kind of make this a little bit better. You know, I'm just going to do this again because I... So the x-axis is the theta, which is degrees, and the y-axis is basically the row, which they're here calling x prime. And so again, we know for this circle that 
no matter what theta I take, I always see the same projection, right? So if I was to think about taking a cross section, a basically a vertical line through this, I would get one of the pictures I showed before that looked like the, the hump that is the same from any angle, right? On the other hand, if I were to take my other image, this guy, and look at the sinogram of this, this would be very different. So that looks like this. So again, the way to think about this is that from pushing the image just down onto the x-axis, I would see the big circle followed by the little circle, right? In the middle, if I were to push it across 90 degrees, what I would see would be the big circle and the little circle overlapping, which was that little extra hump that you saw. And then as I change the angle, you know, basically there's, there are some points of view where the little circle doesn't overlap with the big circle, and there are some where it does, right? So kind of what you see is this kind of two moons, you know, overlapping with each other. And of course, for a real image, the sinogram looks even more complicated. But if you know what you're looking at, you can kind of think about interpreting why the image looks like this, right? And so one of the homework problems is basically to take another image and look at the sinogram of it, I believe, and think about why does it look like the way it looks, right? <clears throat> okay, so questions or comments about this picture. Okay, so my first idea was to see what would happen if I were to take these projections from different angles, smear them, back project them, and add them up, right? So mathematically, what would be happening there? So, so say we have a set of projections, right? I'm going to assume here that this is like a continuous function of rho, but a discrete function of theta, or a set of angles, theta k, between 0 and pi. The reason I'm only going halfway around the circle is that I get the, basically the same projection if I project from up to down versus if I project from down to up, right? So I really only have <coughs> half a circle of unique projections. And so now what I want to do is I want to take my, you know, here's my g of rho comma theta k, and I want to kind of smear it, which means that for each, for if a fixed rho, what I want to do is I want to basically kind of like copy this pixel along this angle, right? So I kind of want to smear this value here along this direction to create a new image. And so for a fixed value, I'm going to fix one of my rows and one of my thetas just copy this value into the image along the corresponding line. Okay? And so again, the corresponding line is x cosine theta plus y sine theta this row. And so basically, if I fix these things, this tells me which x's and y's should get that bit of intensity. And so one way of saying this is that the smeared image, which I'm going to call uh, so this is basically the back projected image at theta. is equal to taking this profile and smearing it in this way, right? So this is like saying, okay, 
what's happening at xy, well, I have to figure out for this xy, what is the corresponding row in theta, right? This is the corresponding row, and I already know the theta because I'm telling you what theta it comes from, right? So here I have to know which of the projections lines up with each of the thetas, right? And so then if I want to reconstruct um, basically the sum of back projections, which is going to be basically uh, just this, I take all my thetas that I got and I add these images up. And those are the kinds of pictures that I was showing you before. Those are actually called laminograms. <clears throat> okay. So this was our first attempt, right? And as we saw visually, this has this problem with blur. Okay? But at least this is what's mathematically going on. So let me pause and ask any questions about this. Yeah. Why is that a sum? So the idea is that this is kind of one single smeared projection. Okay. And then what I was showing you earlier was if we add these projections up, I start to get that blurry image, right? Okay, but the increments are a specific theta. Right. So I have a set of specific theta. So I have a, basically a discrete set of theta that I'm adding up from different directions, okay. right? I mean, I could make this an integral if I had a continuous set of theta, but I'm assuming that I'm just choosing some set of theta. Okay. Other questions? OK, so now the real fun begins. So uh, we have to understand how can we do a better reconstruction. And so <coughs> in order to understand what was going on in the first place, we need to go to the Fourier domain, everyone's favorite place. And we're going to prove something called the Fourier slice theorem. OK, so the Fourier slice theorem is pretty cool. Sometimes it's called the uh, projection slice theorem. And it's going to give us the relationship between the Fourier transform of each of these projections and the original image that we were trying to reconstruct in the first place. OK? So, Basically, it's a relationship between, I go back to my picture here, the idea is that this image has a 2D Fourier transform, right? Each of these projections has a 1D Fourier transform. And there's some notion that those two things should be related somehow, right? I should be able to get this Fourier transform from this 2D Fourier transform, okay? That's the idea. Okay, so let's uh, consider a fixed angle theta's uh, projection. Oh no, it seems like my pen is running out. This is the worst time. And take the, both of my pens are running out. Uh oh. Let's see what we got in the tray here. Nothing good. Pencil, really? Let's see how this comes out. The 1D for your transform, I guess it's better than nothing. No, well, it's all right. With respect to rho. Okay, so basically, this is going to be like the thing that we use to take our Fourier transform. And so, um, this is kind of like rho is kind of like the time domain. And I'm going to convert that to what I'm going to call omega, which is going to be kind of like the interpretation of the frequency domain. <coughs> okay, so I'm going from my g rho of theta to capital G omega of theta. Theta is just coming along for the ride to remind me that I'm fixing that particular angle. Okay, so my g here is just our usual Fourier transform. This guy, e to the minus j 2 pi omega rho d rho. Okay? 
So this is nothing new. <coughs> if anyone has a thicker pen, I will take it. OK, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in what do I know about this Fourier transform. OK, well, I'm going to write what I know about the radon transform. Well, let's go back here. I define the radon transform over here, right? So I'm just going to plug this in to this to make an even worse integral. So let's see. That's like saying that I have an integral out here, which is going to be my d rho. I have the integral for the radon transform. This is my original image. Here is this delta function. Here is my dx dy. And then I have e to the minus j 2 pi omega rho d rho. Then I have to apply my usual trick, which is to switch the rows and the x's and y's, right? So I'm going to, again, I have a triple integral where I'm going to take out the xy part. So let's see. I can take out this part. This doesn't have anything to do with rho. Then I have to have this thing. <coughs> Then I have dx dy. OK. And now I know what happens when I have the delta function, right? So all I do is I say, well, this integral purely uh, exists when this guy is 0, right? So I plug in the row for which this condition is true. So I get this thing, e to the minus 2 pi. Two pi j omega. When is this going to fire? It's going to fire for these particular values of x and y, dx dy. OK, now I can do a little change of coordinates. OK, so instead of using uh, x and y, I'm going to use polar coordinates. So I'm going to say basically, um, actually, I'm going to change the, actually, I'm not going to really do this at all. I will do that later. I'm going to write this in a slightly different way. I'm going to write it like this, e to the minus 2 pi j and then I'm going to write uh, write it like this, ux plus vy dx dy. So for this to work, my u has to be equal to omega cosine theta, and my v has to be equal to omega sine theta. Okay. Why did I do this? Because now this thing looks basically like uh, a Fourier transform, a 2D Fourier transform. So what I'm saying is that this actually is exactly the Fourier transform of, of the original image, right? This is like the Fourier transform of the original image. along the line uh, u equals omega cos theta, v equals omega sine theta. So this is pretty exciting. What this means is that here's my projection part, right? So here's this guy. I take this is my projection. And what we're talking about is what do I get when I take the Fourier transform of this one dimensional signal? What I learned was that it's like taking, you know, let's call the Fourier transform of this, 
just like a little Fourier transform like this. I guess I should have. This is called f of uv. And what are the uv's I'm evaluating? I'm evaluating at this exact line here. So if this is my you know weird complex value Fourier transform, that's like saying that the 1D Fourier transform of the projection equals the slice through the 2D Fourier transform of the image at basically the same angle. Right? So this, this makes it very immediate to say, okay, if I want to get the Fourier transfer of this, I take the 2D Fourier transfer of the image, and I just look at the corresponding diagonal line going through the center. Okay? So in principle, every time we take a projection, we're getting another slice through the Fourier transform. And this kind of is the intuition for why I should be able to reconstruct from projections, because if I sample finely enough, I'm going to get all the slices through the Fourier transform that I need. Okay, so that's good, right? That, that's the intuition for why this should work and why I need to have a lot of thetas to make it work, right? And this picture also tells me why I have the blurriness problem, why I have this incorrect reconstruction. The reason is that in practice, what I have, again, if I look at this as the, uh, if this is my 2D Fourier transform of the image, what I'm getting is, you know, I'm getting kind of a slice of the transformation here, and I'm getting a slice of the transformation here, and I'm getting a slice of the transformation here, and so on. And if I add all these slices up directly, the problem is that the middle of this guy is kind of like overrepresented, right? Because all the slices overlap at the middle. So that means that there's too much stuff being added up in the middle, right? Maybe around the edges, I've got the right thing, but in the middle, each of these guys is adding up more than it should, right? I really only want to have the middle sampled once. So this is arguing for the fact that what I want to do is I want to take each of these slices and I want to weight each of the slices so that it's lower in the middle and higher at the ends, right? So when I add them up, I get exactly the contribution that I want in the middle and everything is even, right? So uh, the idea is that the middle of the Fourier transform, the 2D Fourier transform, is oversampled. That means that summing up um, back projections directly is inaccurate. And it's inaccurate in, in the way that we saw, which is that things are blurry, right? It's like I'm adding low frequency stuff to the image that shouldn't be there, right? I'm not adding noise like salt and pepper noise. I'm adding blur, which I know is low frequency, right? That's why. <coughs> and so the intuition is we should downweight the middle. Okay, and so this leads to an algorithm that is what we do use called filtered back projection, right? Meaning that I'm not just going to add the back projections up directly, I'm going to do something to them before they add them up. <coughs> All right, so let me pause and ask <coughs> any questions. I can keep my voice going for another 20 minutes. I should have brought my huge Gatorade. Okay, so here we go. So this is the idea behind what's called filtered back projection. So what do we want? We want to take my image, I guess I should say I called it I, right? So I want to get back my original image, which is just the inverse Fourier transform 
like this, right? This is our definition of the 2D inverse Fourier transform, du dv. Okay. And now I'm going to do a change of coordinates, right? Because here, because of the nature of the way I'm taking the slices, I want to change this to kind of like polar coordinates of the Fourier transform, right? So now I'm going to do a change of coordinates of the Fourier transform to polar. That means that, just like what I said before, I've got u is omega cosine theta, v is omega sine theta. That means that du dv is omega d omega d theta, right? This is just like r dr d theta from you know, polar coordinates, right? Except I'm calling omega r. Okay, so that means that if I rewrite this thing in polar coordinates, I get this. So theta goes from zero to pi, radius goes, or omega goes from basically minus infinity to infinity. Then I have my f, then I have my, I guess I have to actually can't use uv anymore because I just redefined it. U becomes omega cosine theta, omega sine theta. Then I have e to the j, 2 pi. <coughs> then I've got kind of a mess up here. This becomes x cosine theta plus y sine theta times omega. Then I have omega d omega d theta, right? This is like the r d r d theta. Okay. But wait, this is good. Why is it good? It's good because I just came up with this thing, right, over here, right? After all this, what I came up with was that, if I can find my piece of paper, I guess I came up with this, right? This is like saying that this is like the Fourier transform of this guy here, right? This is kind of, I'm evaluating the Fourier transform of the image at this point, and the Fourier slice theorem tells me that I'm asking exactly about this line. I know the Fourier transform <coughs> here. It's the Fourier transform of my projection, right? Which I called this. So that means that by the Fourier slice theorem, For your slice theorem, that's exactly equal to the Fourier transform of the corresponding projection at theta. Then I've got this junk up here. Okay. And I can make a little bit of a substitution here. So instead of going all the way around the circle, I really only know that I have to go halfway around the circle. And it turns out that projecting this direction and the other direction are basically the same thing. So this is a homework problem or possibly an exam problem to show that this is true. Why is this true? It's true since if I project from theta plus pi, I basically get the reverse projection here. It's kind of saying that, you know, if I have this guy, here I get this. If I projected the other way, I would get this, right? So it's like I flip the omega around this way. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it all up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this is like equal to
the middle guy, is equal to this integral where I evaluate along this line. Right, all I'm doing is I'm kind of getting rid of this by calling it rho and saying that I've got this integral that I evaluate here. And so again, if I didn't have this, this would just like be the inverse Fourier transform of each of the projections. But here, I'm multiplying it by this number, right? And this is kind of telling me that this is how I have to modify each of the projections before I add them up, right? So here, this. This is kind of like, think of this as the sum, you know, of adding up a bunch of discrete projections instead of a sum I've turned into an integral. So this is the idea is that <coughs> this on the inside is just the uh, inverse Fourier transform of this guy, but multiplied by a filter function, absolute value of omega. And so these are what we call um, the filtered back projections. Taking the place of the actual Originally, we were just adding up these back projections. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm adding up these filtered back projections. So, <clears throat> what we came up with is this is the mathematically correct thing to do. Right? Because if I go back and look at what started this whole chain, was that the beginning of this was the original image, right? So, this tells me how to get the original image from ba da ba da ba. These are the Fourier transforms of the original um, slices. Okay. So, I'm going to show you just an example of that in just a second, but let me just kind of reiterate the, the main idea. So, overall, first thing I do is that I compute the 1D Fourier transform of each projection. Then I multiply each Fourier transform, which I could call, for example, G of omega, by this absolute of omega, absolute value of omega. Then I take the 1D inverse Fourier transform, and then I integrate, or I sum up over all angles to get my original image. And so clearly, you know, this, uh, this kind of assumes that I have an infinite number of projections, right? And in practice, I need to have enough projections that I get close to the ideal result, okay? And for those of you that are still following along heroically, one minor comment to make, which is, if you're really, like, super knowledgeable about the Fourier transform, is what is this, you know, what does this function absolute value of omega look like, right? It looks like this. And you notice that we never took Fourier transforms of functions like this back in single systems. And the reason was that 
it integrates to infinity, right? And that's the kind of thing that I can't take the Fourier transform. That's like one of the rules of Fourier transforms. And so typically, what happens in practice is that we uh, multiply this by some sort of a function that, like a window, so that what I'm actually multiplying it by is something that looks kind of more like, you know, like this. Right? This is like what happens when I multiply these things together. So this could be like a Hamming window. It's called the Hamming window. And this is to prevent <coughs> possible, you know, Fourier transform kind of uh, numerical issues. I mean, I could just kind of make a box and cut it off at higher frequencies. But if I did that, I would probably get these kinds of ringing artifacts that we know come from boxes in the frequency domain corresponding to sinks in the time domain. <coughs> OK. So let's look at some results. So luckily, you don't have to code any of this yourself, right? So if I just look at the radon and inverse radon transforms, So you can see here that the help for radon gives me these options, right? So here, what I was doing before was no filtering, right? That's just like adding up the projections directly, which we know is bad. The default for this function is this ram lack, which is basically just the absolute value of, of you know, omega, right? Which is just what I told you about. And they say it's cropped, meaning I think they just cut it off with a box filter. But then you could multiply that by any of these windows to make it smoother. So the inverse random transform gives you all those options if you like. And so let's see what we get. So again, let's take our uh, original circle. And let's take the, uh, I'm just going to kind of put all this together. So let me make a vector of theta that is OK like this. And then what I look at is the uh, inverse radon transform of the forward radon transform of the image at these thetas. I supply the same thetas back to the inverse radon transform. And I look at this as an image. And if this worked, I should get this. OK, so then. Basically, this is saying that if I only have like 20 projections, then I start to get the circle, right? And this is not enough. I need to have more projections. So if I were to use, uh, let's say, you know, 10 degrees instead, things start to get a little better. And if I start to use, say, 1 degree, You know, looks pretty good, right? And you can see that there are some, you know, kind of noisy artifacts here. But certainly the interior of the circle looks flat like it should. It doesn't look kind of, you know, brighter in the middle like it did before. The edge of the circle is very sharp, which is good. Uh, and then, you know, kind of get these little spirograph looking artifacts that come from, you know, the diffusion of this hard edge in the image. But, you know, this is actually quite good. And the same thing is going to be true for my other image. So if I do uh, <coughs> this guy, and then I look at the corresponding high number of theta inverse random transform, like this, right? Again, no problems with blurring, no problems with that dark circle getting too dark. Um, but these kind of characteristic diffusion E artifacts that come from these hard edges. And so um, MATLAB will also let you, you know, there's uh, built in phantom. So if you just say phantom of some size, what you get is something that is uh, kind of like a standard for approximating 
kind of a, I'm not sure whether this is meant to approximate a human body, but it's kind of like a, you know, you can imagine that maybe the dark circle, maybe these are like your, your weirdly shaped lungs, this is your heart, this is your spinal cord, the outer rim is your body. I mean, it's not really super accurate. I mean, actually, this doesn't make any sense in some sense because this is saying that you've got a white area, like a hard bony shell around your abdomen, right? So that doesn't definitely occur for humans. But you can still show, uh, you know, the reconstruction of it. Right, so here's the before and after. And I guess that the reason that they like this phantom is that if you look at the uh, calling sequence, you can kind of tune the contrast of each of these blobs with respect to the background, right? So you could say, okay, well, how would this perform if these blobs were slightly lighter? At some point, it would be tough to reconstruct these from the kind of noise that gets added to the image, right? But, you know, this is the basic idea. Okay, so comments or questions about this? So kind of what I'm going to ask you to do on homework is to basically take a different image, take the random transform, take the inverse random transform, interpret what you see for different you know, spacings of theta, that kind of thing. Okay, the final thing I want to say is just a couple of little uh, further implementation notes. So, <coughs> so um, you know, MATLAB, I believe, I could be wrong, it used to, does this all with FFTs, right? Everything is in the Fourier domain. But most CAT scans, most CT systems, do everything in the spatial domain. With convolutions. So let me just take what I end up with, right? This was my final result. I had, these were my integral of the filter back projections. This is where I basically ended up last time, <clears throat> except I put a, uh, I put the window in here too to remind myself that in the real world we have to probably put a window on there. So here, right, what I've got here is the Fourier transform of something times another function, right? And so I could say that instead of doing that Fourier transform, I could just think about this as a, you know, this S of rho is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of this guy here. And since I'm multiplying in the frequency domain, this would be like convolving in the time domain or the spatial domain. So what I did was, basically, I removed this complex Fourier transform here, and I replaced it with something where I'm just taking every literal projection that I get and convolving it with this other function, and then adding those up, right? So this is just like a kind of a spatial domain version of this. Um, and if I wanted to be really explicit about it, which is even worse, it would look something like this. So I take the, this convolved with this. Right, this would be like a 1D spatial convolution. So in some sense, one advantage of this idea is that if I'm just kind of storing up the sum of back projections, I don't actually have to store them all, right? All I have to do is kind of loop through every projection, and every time I get one, I do this convolution and I add it to my result, right? So, you know, 
<coughs> practical notes for when you implement your own CT scanner. So no need to uh, store all back projections. Just add them up as they come in. Um, another comment, if you were really paying attention, <coughs> is that since this function here, the ideal function, is zero, at this point, we really don't know what the DC value of the Fourier transform is going to be. So we lose something. So since this equals zero, at may equals zero, we lose the DC value in the filtered back projection algorithm. And all you really do is you just scale your result or you guess what the DC value is, right? So I think that what you were seeing in those MATLAB examples was just the <coughs> result that you got scaled so that the darkest thing was black and the brightest thing was white, and it looked fine, right? But I mean, if you were really concerned about not just the structure, but also the precise value of the grayscale of one of those things, that would be a problem. And so, <coughs> finally, so today's systems use a fan beam or a more complicated and we're going to talk about that next time. Right? But the difference is basically that today the future systems, instead of just shooting parallel rays across the patient, like in this upper left-hand corner, instead it's more like the lower left-hand corner, which is that the rays from the X-ray source are diverging. That means that we have a different projection geometry. And so we can prove, I need to decide exactly how tedious I'm going to be in the next lecture about proving what happens with this geometry, that a similar reconstruction theorem can be derived. and. Also, another way of thinking about it is that you can convert this fan beam geometry with a clever resorting of rays into a parallel beam geometry, which then you could apply in the stuff from today. So we'll talk about that on Thursday. Again, that's going to be also mathematically tedious. Um, but on the other hand, I have to get to the airport in the early afternoon, so I may have a shorter lecture where I give you the high points of fan beam reconstruction and then take off early. So we'll see how that goes on Thursday. But that's the basic idea. So any comments or questions about parallel beam reconstruction? Really, the only thing I need you to know for the exam, for example, and your general edification is this radon transform. So the radon transform and this notion of reconstruction from filtered back projections, that's fair game to talk about on the exam and to talk about in general knowledge. The stuff on Thursday is a little bit more out there, and you're not going to need to worry about that too much. Okay, so.